Welcome to the Barbarian Hour podcast, where we conquer the impossible. The Barbarian Hour podcast is presented by Barbarian Apparel. Here is Jared Opfer and Zeb Miller. Are you ready? Hello, wrestlers and coaches. I'm Teague Moore. I spent 20 years coaching at the Division I level in the NCAA, 15 of those years as a head coach. During that time, I helped a lot of wrestlers and parents navigate the recruiting process. I've now opened my own consulting business to do just that, to help you navigate the recruiting process. There's a lot of unanswered questions. How do scholarships work? What program would be right for my son? Or better yet, what coach would be right for my wrestler? I can help answer these and many other questions. Feel free to email me or call me at the information listed below, and we can set up your first consultation today. I look forward to working with you and helping you make the right choice. All right. Barbarian hour here with Jim Andersey. Coach Andersey is the head coach for the Kent State Golden Flashes. Coach Andersey, you have been in Kent, Ohio since 1990. Is that true or 91? No, I got, I got there in the fall of 1990 as, as a freshman. And you have not left. I have not left. That is exactly correct. (laughs) Okay. So for you, you are actually, then you went right into being like a GA and a coach. So you've actually never left that program where it's like, I I had Spates on last week. He's, he made a couple pit stops um, before he got to Edwardsville. And, uh, but you are, you are Kent state through and through. You've been the head coach since 0304 when you were the interim, correct? For yes. For about six months. Yep. And then they made you head coach in 04. Listen, you know more than I did. This my first. It's been. It seems it all kind of just overlaps. But yes, that sounds about right. So, oh four, you're going into like 19 years as the head coach. Yep. And then you have been the interim counts that that year. So. Yep. Um, was your first All American in 2009. That sounds about right too, Jamail. Well, Jamail became an All American before Bellion, but it was at the same tournament. It was the same round. He won to get into the semifinals. Yes. Jamail made the semifinals and Badlion beat Joey Fio in the round of 12. Yes. There you go. So you guys, you had two All-Americans. You guys went from zero All-Americans in 23 years to two in one night. That's correct. That yes. had to feel pretty good, right? It did. It did. And we, you know, the funny thing is we had uh, Drew Lashway was in, in the round to be All-American. Danny Mitchell was in the round to be All-American. Um, and Kilgore was like the sixth seed and, and just got upset and didn't have a very good tournament. At one point that tournament, I took a picture. We were in, it was the second day at the end of the first round and we were in like 12th place. Wow. It was pretty, it was pretty cool. So you, know, you guys see, finished it, like 16th or 17th think, that year. Didn't yeah, you? I think 16th or 17th. Yep. yep. Okay. So if all those guys, let's just say this. Uh, Lashley gets beat in the run of 12 by Molinaro. He gets like banana splitted, right? Gave up, gave up six or right at the bat. Molinaro was a freshman. Molinaro was a freshman. Yeah. Yep. He got, gave up six right at the bat and he lost, I want to say nine to eight. Okay. So he loses. Kilgore doesn't place. Kilgore's like a five seed. He doesn't place. Yep. And then Mitch, if loses to the guy, he beat the Maryland guy, right? It was like, he, star, right. They, they went, they've gone, they went back and forth their whole career, but the last time they wrestled, he had beaten him at the scuffle in a really, I like, might've been overtime. And this was, it was just today's rules. It, it's fleeing the mat. He did it twice. You know, Danny, he had Danny at his leg and, and, you know, you scoot out of bounds and, Danny just like, where he ended up getting the leg both times, he ended up going out of bounds. But he, like it's it's swing the mat now, but back then it wasn't. So that's how that's how he lost that match. So yeah. you got if you had you could have had five All Americans that year. You ended up with two. That's actually not bad in like your fifth year as the head coach. Yeah, and I don't think anyone predicted that we'd go and even score the points we did. I think that you know Kil- Kilgore was really the only guy that was ranked or seated in the top eight. So. We did pretty good. <laughs> we did pretty good. I would say you guys had a pretty good tournament. Was it hard, you know, because like we talked to all these coaches. I talked to all these coaches and everybody, that's what we judge everybody on, right? Like media does it, fans do it, other coaches do it, athletes do it. You know, how, when's the last time you had an All-American? Yeah. It's not really a fair standard, I don't think. But was it hard, as hard to, to have it happen as you thought it would be? That's a really good question, Zeb. I think when back then it was just – 
I think our teams just were, we got better and better every single year. And it wasn't, we definitely wanted all Americans, but it wasn't like, I didn't let it define us, but I think when it happened, it was like, all right, this is about right. And then, you know, and then, you know, our teams got better and better. And then we, we kind of kept that momentum for, I want to say about eight years. We it seemed like we either had an all American every year or, or we were, we had good teams. And, you know, last time we had an all American, we had two of them to kind of end that streak. Um, and it, you know, it was, it was pretty good. So it just, it, it just lasted a long time. I think now we're kind of like, like three or four years out from having one um, since uh, Canel, but you know, and like right now it's kind of, it's like, all right, who's going to be the guy that, to step up and, and bring that kind of air to the room. And if you think about that team, Belion did it. He ended up doing it again. Um, Porter did it. Mitch have did it the following year. Lashway didn't, but I think, you know, I think if you get, if you, Lashway only wrestled for four years because he's only on our team for four years because he was a, a um, non-qualifier because of that, that real bad accident he had. So as a junior, he didn't go to school and he missed a bunch of classes. So he came in as a non-qualifier. So he was only on our team for four years. I think if you give him a fifth year in a college room, he's 100% an All-American the following year. So it, just, it was just the progression. And we had the, all those guys were really determined. They kind of changed our program, you know, to, to say the least, I think. Well, you look at those guys, right? Bedley on Mitchiff, Kilgore, right? They're coaching at the next level right now. What's that like? You know, they, they came from your program, right? Now they're coaching at the next level. So that speaks to the guys they are, but what's that like, you know, your relationship with them, coaching them and now, you know, you know being peers with them? Yeah, well, if, if, to get this even a little, a little more interesting, every guy that's an All-American is coaching somewhere except for Jermail, and he owns his uh, – he owns a he's coaching a he different probably, fashion. Yeah. He probably hated the wrestling the most out of all. He was just a big guy and he had to find something to do. And, and at the, it was a, you, I don't know if you guys watch his videos. You watch his, oh, yeah. His, yeah. If he could, if he would have done that stuff when he wrestled, he could have been a three or four time, you know, all American national champ because he's so strong and big now. He just never really understood it, you know. And, and uh, when he, when he was in college, he never understood how strong he'd be or how, how big and just athletic that he ended up becoming. So that's kind of the, the, the link there. But, all the other guys, it's great seeing them with Bedley on and, 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 you know, Mitch was with me, but seeing Bedley on, we, we text all the time, Matt Hill, Texas and, and Kilgore's out in air, air force. He's actually trying to get into a diff, little different direction now, but it's fun. It's national tournaments, fun getting together. Last year, we all got together at Matt Hill, Kilgore, Danny was with us. Um, Bedley on was there. So it was a lot of fun. Ian, we saw Ian the other day. Last week I was at the, uh, I was at the Appy state tournament. And I'm looking around, and I think there was about eight, nine teams there. I was the oldest coach there. And it's kind of, I've never can, looked at myself as an older guy or an older coach, and I was the oldest coach there. <laughs> so it's kind of, it's, it's, been a, it's, it's been a long run for me, a good run so far, I think. You had a culture change, right? And I remember you went through this crazy culture change because what happened was you took over in 03, 04, right? Yep. And then – you had this culture change. Jared was actually on the team and you yep. had to do all this stuff where you had late night practices, and 6 a.m. Halloween practices, and just all this stuff you had to go through just to get the guys out that you wanted out and the guys in that you wanted in and you had to have buy-in. How hard was that process? Well, And was that as necessary as, as you thought it was to, to do that? 5 a.m. practices to do the midnight practices. Was it was it everything you thought it would be? It's ironic because both you two were on the teams that we didn't have the success that everyone thought we should have been having. Correct? I think that's the, right. the easy way to say it. Hundred so, percent. Right. And I was there before you. And you know, as a freshman, I was ranked eighth in the country. As a true freshman, I was ranked eighth in the country at this time of the year. You know, when I was a true freshman, and why didn't I ever progress? And I got to kind of see it as an athlete. And I'm not blaming anything. I love my experience as an athlete, a student athlete. But after I was done, I'm like, man, I kind of, I kind of get why I didn't have the success that, that I wanted. And it wasn't, I don't want, it wasn't a coach's fault. It was just, Kent was just a different place then. And it was, we thought we were all doing the right things. I, you know, as, as student athletes, we thought we were all doing, we were doing it. So when I became the assistant, it was kind of, I was young still, and it was really hard to change it because ultimately you need the head coach to buy into it too. So I, I tried to do as much as I could as the assistant coach at some point when, Romano left. I ne really didn't think I'd get the job, to be honest with you, because the way Romano left and how it all happened, I just thought that, you know, they were going to go out and try to find someone different. So at that point, you know, went through the whole process. When they opened up the job, there was like 12 people that applied for it the first time around. And uh, 
Wasn't Terry Brands one of them? No, no, no. It was um, the other coach, the, 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 the Iowa guy that was um, was at. Uh, he was at. He's like the club coach for Iowa. He's the older guy too. He's old, older than me. Uh, Mike DeRoe. Name. Yes, there you go, Mike DeRoe. He came in and put to, to back up here. The first, the first time around, twelve people applied, and they're like, "Yeah, we can't, we can't even." I was one of them. They came to me and they said, "We're, we're gonna." wrestle the whole year and then we're going to open it up in the springtime and i said okay that's fine i you know i I'm, I'm good with that and about somewhere in late summer i went back into the office i said listen i think you're i go this isn't about me i think you're really not doing the best thing for your student athletes and they look you know kathy o'donnell and lane kenny looked at me and go what do you mean i go well you have guys that are gonna head a frank romano as a coach for one year they're gonna have me for a year if i don't get the job they're gonna have a third coach in three years and and that's really hard. It's a really hard thing to do for a student. I go, it's almost not fair to the student athlete. I go, have you guys figured out why you only had 12 applicants? And, and they said, yes. And I go, I think you ought to reopen the job position, open it up longer. Here's people to contact. And I gave them some places to contact. And, and one of them is they called up Gable and they said, you know, we need to get some applicants to, to apply for this job. And one of the big things is, is the, the amount they were paying was so low. You know, for me, it was a raise because I was the assistant coach, but it was so low. It was crazy. So they, they anted the amount of money. And, um, and then they, the next time around, they had about 50 people that applied for it. Um, very, I actually got, when it was all over, I got to see who the applicants were, but Darrow was one of them. And, and Darrow came in and, and, you know, even from Iowa, you come to Kent and Kathy O'Donnell and Lane Kennedy wanted to be in charge and they wanted to tell the coaches that. And the interviews went a little different from what I've heard, um, if that makes sense. Um, Oklahoma, Oklahoma coach, the, the, you know, what's his name at, uh, it was it's at Oklahoma right now. Uh, Roselli. Roselli applied for it. He was on an interview and and same type of thing. Roselli, at the end of the day, Roselli, I don't think was was leaving Edinburgh, but he was interested in. They just weren't paying enough for him from what it came down to. And like at that point, he held out a few more years and they get the assistant at Ohio State, so that all worked out for him. But at the end of the day, Kent State wanted to have a good program, but they the biggest concern they wanted was they wanted our student athletes to to behave themselves because it was a kind of a wild place. And, and I knew that, I knew that the big, their biggest concern was just the behavior of our student athletes. And um, during that process, it was our fall. And if anyone knows fall in Kent, you know, Thursday nights and Fridays and Saturdays are all a lot of fun. And there's always kids getting in trouble. So when we started the season, we, you know, we Thursday nights, we'd have thir like a late Thursday night practice because I knew that Thursday night, if, we practice at about 10 o'clock. It would go until about 1130. By the time they shower, they get back to their place at 12. And on Friday morning, we had set Friday morning lift or practice, whichever one we decided to do. They only gave them about six hours of sleep, so they weren't going out. So then that was that was Friday morning. Friday night, we kind of let them do what they wanted, but I had a 6 more six a.m. practice on Saturdays right off the bat. So that left Saturday, Friday night, you really couldn't do anything. And then Saturday, I had six o'clock practice. And I didn't, I gave them like Tuesday and Wednesdays off. So they practiced through the weekend. And we started off the season that year with about 36 kids. We ended with 12, if I remember correctly. <laughs> just kids quit. They just didn't want to do it. And, and I was okay with that. Um, and then the second year, we, we ended up getting, you know, recruiting a bunch of kids. We had about 30. We ended up with about 22. And then the following year was the first time we were ever ranked in the history of the sport. So it was my third year. We were ranked, we ended the year ranked around 23rd. Um, I, I, and then from there, the following year, we, we ended with 20, like six the following year, we came back with 28. So we kept the whole team back. And it was just one of those things where we finally had the right kids that wanted to do it. We didn't care about the, the Saturday morning practices or the Thursday night practices. So it went on for about four years. We were doing these odd practices on the weekends. And at that point, I kind of backed off a little because I, I knew I had the right kids and, and the older kids bought into it and they knew what would happen if, if they, if, you know, they got in trouble. So they kept the young guys out of trouble. And it was just like a cycle that we had a break. And the only way I was doing it was by getting rid of the kids that didn't want to, that would rather be out on a Thursday night at two in the morning than, you know, getting ready for practice the next day. So that freshman class would have been like Artie and Ramadani, Aaron Miller, Right. Yes. Those yes. are the guys you had to get buy-in from, right? Kirk, Kirk Gross. Kirk Gross. Yes. Yep. And those and guys did buy-in. Mike. They, Tolar, oh, they bought in. No question. Yep. But is buy-in as easy as you thought it would be? <laughs> no. I, I I knew I knew how long it would take. I didn't know I didn't know I that I'd have that many kids quit. I thought that you know like I 
as a coach, I love wrestling. I've always loved wrestling. I, I loved it when I was a student athlete. I thought kids were like, all right, this is what we have to do to be good. He knows what he's talking about. And, you know, the ironic part is I really didn't know what I was talking about because I was only, it's only from what I've seen on the outside and what I think you had to do. I didn't like, you know, I didn't see an all American when I wrestled there. I didn't, I wasn't coached to be an all American in my opinion. So I was kind of doing a little bit of guessing and saying, all right, this is what I think has to happen. This is how we're going to do it. And, uh, at the end of the day, it took some time, but it, it did work. We had the right, the biggest thing was just getting the right kids. And once you got a few of the right kids, it became a lot easier. And who was know, the first guy? Was Kilgore that guy or badly on who was that guy? I, I want to say it was like, this, this might sound oddly. You guys are going to kind of giggle, but Kurt Gross really bought into, like he bought into the whole thing, except for the academics. He bought into the hard work and he was a kind of play hard, work hard type of guy. So I don't know if, he, you know, but, but he bought into everything I told him as far as just so we got to do be good. And, and, you know, made it to the national tournament a few times and was close. Um, Alex Camargo was really bought into it. And like I said, you look right. at Alex and those guys had some fun in college, if I remember correctly, especially in the spring. I kind of backed off a little bit in the spring when, you know, but we still did a lot of the, the stuff that, that you need to do prior to the season. And then, we, you know, we started doing summer workouts and all those guys were there for summer. Um, all that you named, like I said, you guys probably remember the era better than I do just because I've had so many kids come through and I'm, you know, it's, it's kind of like groundhog's day for me a little bit. Um, but you know, it, those are the guys that, yeah, really changed it. And then once we got Bedley on and, and, and like Jermail and Danny Mitchell, you, you know, you add that with Kilgore and you had those combinations and we knew once Kilgore got there that we, we you, you had a guy, like I knew I watched Kilgore as a sophomore. I'm like, this guy is this is a kid you want. Then I watched him as a junior. I'm like, there's no doubt this is what we want. And the funny thing is, is we found out all the background information. If any other Big Ten would have found out any of the background information, they would have offered him the full ride that he wanted. If you tell Kilgore, Kilgore's two things is he wanted a full ride and he wanted a red shirt. You know, Big Ten schools don't want to offer full rides. Kilgore was on like 64% at Kent State because he got the full financial aid package. We knew that because his sister was at Kent. So apparently the Big Ten schools didn't, you know, do their homework and find out, hey, you got a sister, Sean, Sean Bell Grant. Okay, you're going to get the same type of thing. But we, you know, we knew they're going into it that we are going off a full ride. It was going to cost us 60%. Kilgore is worth, you know, nowadays he's worth for a program like us, cost of attendance, a full ride plus cost of attendance. So, you know, we only had to pay 62% for him back there. So it was a great deal. And then when he moved off campus, we, you know, we, we asked me, hey, take a little bit less, here's your bills. And he's like, sure, you know, Kilgore. As long as he got, he had enough food and he got the restroom. That's all he cared about. <laughs> and protein. He wanted protein drinks and he, and he oh, wanted food in our office because he, yeah, oh yeah, hundred percent. Do you believe that guy's a father now? Well, he <laughs> hashtag girl dad. <laughs> yes, he's, he's just like you, Jim. so much. He's just yeah. like you too. Hashtag yeah. girl dad. Yeah, <laughs> that's a whole other story. Hundred percent, it is. Both of us, Jared too. I remember. Yeah. I remember we were on the bus when I think you found out your youngest. You have another daughter, and now now I'm living it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I found two of my kids out when I was on the bus. Uh, you know, uh, I got on the bus with get wrestlers, and I'm like, oh. I remember Nick. Ma I, I was sitting next to Nick Magistrelli as a he was an I was an assistant coach. I'm on the phone, find out it, it's a girl, and I hang up the phone. I go, man, I go, I don't. What am I gonna do with a girl? I looked at it, and he goes, Nick goes, just you know, Nick is 18 years old. I'm 24, and he goes, all I can do is love him, Jim. And I'm like, it's a girl. He's like, you'll be fine. Just love him. And I'm like. I guess that sounds about right. Just I remember right. that conversation. I remember yeah. saying, love your kid, man. That's all you got to do is just love your kid. <laughs> that was good perspective, Nick Magistrelli. Hey, Nick. how about that guy still looks 22? He looks pretty good, son. Nick, so Nick Magistrelli looks like 100 bucks, man. That yeah. guy is amazing. He's like a fountain of youth. He is. He, is. he looks incredible, he and he lives in like a 9,000-square-foot house. That's because he's gone all the time. He, he, he leaves his, all, his, all his nine kids to his wife, and he leaves all the time. He's traveling. Travel in the world as his wife's taking care of the kids. Oh my God. Okay. So, okay. So you, I remember when your wife brought Megan to weightlifting in April of 99 and her head was all footballed. Your wife, your wife brought your daughter and her head was like, it was all oblong. And I was like, dude, what's going on? You're like, Seb, all the kids come out. You don't know that. And I, you know, I was an, an idiot. I was like 19 year old moron. And I remember being like, oh, is this how this is going to be? And then my son Thomas has had a super elongated like that. I like learned a, la a valuable lesson. What's crazy is on her own, she lives in Florida now. It's just, it just goes so fast, man. It does. She graduated and she actually she applied on spring break, was offered a job, left, you know, left the day or a week after graduation, 
She's been there since she graduated college. She, you know, she loves it. She's homesick a lot. So she, I, the holidays are probably really hard for her. Um, but she's, right, that's where she always wanted to be is down south. And, and uh, you know, it'd be interesting to see if she stays there once she has kids and, and you know, what happens from the next step. But she, I talked to her today about 30 minutes. She said it was 68 degrees and it was just beautiful outside. I'm like, you know, starting to get cold and I hate the cold weather. So Dude, it's we'll miserable see. outside right now. I burned. I burned a bunch of brush piles today and I was freezing. I was so cold. I was dragging them with my tractor and my four wheeler. And I like got inside and it took me like an hour. And then I said, had to take a hot shower before I was miserable. Yeah. So cold. And it's like my bones were cold, man. It, was, yeah. it sucked. It was terrible. Last fall or last very beginning of winter, I was helping my, uh, my stepdaughter move her. She was moving from one apartment to the other and uh it was cold in there and it was like the first day it snowed and my big toe not the next one but the two one two toes after that went numb like they, they, they went numb they weren't warming up and then i took off my shoe and they were like blue and i'm like what's going on with my feet so i, I finally got them warmed up happened again like the next time i was outside so finally i went to the doctor and i go i go you know i, I told him what happened and it was our team doctor at kent state so i went to, just one day walked in and say doc i talked to you when I talked to him, explained it. And he goes, he goes, I he goes, yeah, and he, he named off what it was, some some disease. I go, okay. I, at, I go, well, what do you do about it? And he goes, you moved to Florida. And I go, well, what do you mean? <laughs> he goes, he goes, next year it'll probably be all four, it'll be all, all your toes. And he goes, next year it'll probably be all your other toes. And he goes, you got a, a circulatory problem. And he goes, it's you're getting older and your body doesn't want to be cold. And, you know, it doesn't generate in, in the in the limbs. I go, well, my hands be fine. He goes, your hands are moving around. You, you can you can rub them together. He goes, your toes. He goes, what happens is, is they're in your shoe. They're probably sweating a little bit, and all of a sudden they get cold, and they don't warm back up, and you don't have enough circulation down there to, to warm them up. I'm like, really? And like this year, it's the other toe, so it's every toe except for the pinky one that, that is cold, and it's just they don't warm back up until I get them inside, and I physically have to warm them up like it isn't like your body keeps them warm it's, it's kind of crazy yeah. <laughs> <Getting old sucks. laughs> terrible this is yeah. terrible yeah oh my god i feel like i remember going to kent state as like a teenager and now we're talking about your feet are freezing because you're old yeah i, I remember <laughs> the days i remember the day you came into our office Sam. you i remember the, the very first day i met you I remember like, not like it was yesterday, but I remember it perfectly. We came in and, and you introduced yourself and you said, you're coming to Kent State. We, you know, you told us you were coming to Kent State. You told us that you verbally committed in the winter to OU. And then you used some language to what Joel did to you. And, and, uh, and they, so they offered you a scholarship, correct? And then you yeah. had to take the money. And I'm like, so you're not going there anymore? And me and, you know, me, me and Coach Ryan had no idea who you were. And next thing you know, you're like, I'm coming. You know, and we, we got all your information. And next thing you know, you're on our team. But it wasn't like we recruited you. No. I, my my guidance counselor, I remember my guidance counselor, Mike Tarinsky. My dad was like, yeah, good luck going to Ohio University. And Greenlee's like, yeah, oh, yeah. Well, I didn't win state. So Greenlee was kind of like, oh, you're kind of a Joe bag of donuts, which he wasn't wrong. And... <laughs> wasn't wrong you know i was like a fifth in the state in division two i was an average guy so why does he need me that's fine right i get that well you don't get it as an 18 year old you get it i get it now as a yeah. man right? which i like joel right i, I have zero hard feelings with joel, joel listen joel changed my life you're right you're right you're right i wouldn't have what i have right now i wouldn't have my kids right now i wouldn't live where i live i my life is completely different wouldn't have my wife She's a Kent State volleyball player. Everything happens for a reason. I, I want to thank him. You know what I mean? Like I, I but but right you didn't thing. like him in college. You were part of the reason that OU and Kent rivalry was so. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, and I always got my ass kicked by his guys. It sucked. And hundred yeah, uh, percent. We won. We won a lot of the time. The only time they yeah. beat us, we beat them in all the dual meets. And we the only time we lost to him at the MAC tournament when I wrestled was when they won it in two thousand. One yep. in Athens, they they beat at their place. That was right? the year. Nemeth, right? Get upset. Yes, Nemeth got yep. beat in the finals. If Nemeth wins, or I, any anyone wins, any one guy wins, we win the championship. We beat yep. Central. We beat Ohio. You, we we win it, right? We we win it. And I remember you made me wrestle for true second against the Central Michigan guy. <laughs> yep. You listen, Jared. This guy took me 
through the bowels of the max uh, the the uh, convocation combo. He mf'd me up one side of it, down the other. I can I can see it right now. Oh my god! What are you gotta wrestle your team? Need you? I don't think they score that match. <laughs> they don't score the true second place match. No, they don't. The they don't. I hate your guts. I like found that out like 15 years later. I'm like, I want to murder him right now. My That's knee was good. all like, I blew my knee out in the third and fourth place match against Northern Illinois guy, but I won. And then I had the Faustman guy from Central Michigan who kicked, he kicked my ass in the duel. But I remember like Mitch, Mitch Hancock and Dave Boyard were heckling me in the corner. I threw yep. my nose plug at him yep. and then I lost to the guy three to two. I lost. Yeah. And then him and uh, the guy who won qualified, but then, then I like someone dropped it on me. Oh yeah. They don't even score the true second place. Not even then. It was like 15 years later. I'm like, Oh my God. Dude, I wanted to walk up to you and like punch you in the face. That was so well, heated he he there. Go ahead, Jim. I was an assistant at that time, but it was also like, you wanted guys that wanted to wrestle. And as an assistant, I knew that we, we like, if Zeppelin's are like, I'm like, if Zeppelin's are wrestle, then like this could happen the same thing a year from now or yeah. two years from now, or yeah. and it was part of trying to change the, 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 the culture of what's going. Yeah. It's like, you know, it was the right thing. You're, I'm not, it was, listen, yeah. I, yeah. it's totally the right thing. I'm not like, I'm trying, I don't want you to hate me, Zeb. That's all. No, no, no. Like at I the time he did, but now at the time I did, it, yes. but now it's like a man because yeah. that, that's the thing. Like I heard you talk to you guys one day. You're like, listen, this wrestling thing's easy. This is easy. Being a dad is hard. Being a professional is hard. Being married is hard. It goes to work every day is hard, right? Yeah. Like, those are the real hard things. Like wrestling is a small window. And I told yeah. Shane Sparks the story and, the, and and I remember like, no, I'm thankful for it now because like you're saying, it was just what you had to do to change the culture, right? Like, even if you look at that, that was in 2001, it's still a part of like, well, wow, now, and it's like the open thing. Well, look what all the guys do at the open. Right. Look at how many guys just like don't wrestle for fifth and six or third or fourth at the open. Everybody yep. quits. Everybody gives up on the open. Yep. And I think that's a part of it. But yeah, I told Shane Sparks. So I remember though, like someone's like, yeah, they don't even score the true second match. I'm like, what? <laughs> I was so mad at you, but I, I get it. You no, know, like I get it. I hundred percent get it. But like being a dad's way harder than wrestling. Wouldn't you agree with that, Jim? hundred percent. It's hundred percent. Like I said, I think, I think in, in, in the world, the two hardest things are to, to raise kids and to be married. And depending on which one's harder at that day, that's the harder one. My opinion. Going to work and, coaching wrestling or even being a college student, I, you know, it's a breeze compared to being married and just, and, you know, just you're living with the person, you know, it's, it's hard. That's all. And, and raising kids is really hard. Those are, again, yeah, this is my opinion. Um, I think as your kids get older, as you, you know, you, you meet the right person, it gets easier. Um, but uh, you know, it, like I said, there's wrestling is easy. <laughs> I would love to wrestle again. Getting old is hard too at this point. Yeah, but your <laughs> right? toes freeze. Your toes freeze. Your hip, you know, hip. Yeah, there's a lot of things going on. I remember I uh, I got married, and uh, I didn't stay married long. And Jim was like, "Yeah, I'm never coming to anything you're ever having. If you get married again, don't invite me because I'm not coming." Well, back up here. Back up here. Hold on. He told second. me not to get married though. Well, okay. Does, so, does Jared yeah. know? Does Jared? I, no one else is probably caring about this conversation except for us. Jared, do you know the whole situation? Uh, so I knew he went out west, right? right. Yeah, yeah, went out west, and like me and Zeb used to talk all the time. He right. used to go places. This is back before Zeb was, a, you know, a superstar and a wrestling hero. Whoever wanted to win it on his time and his business, I'm the only one to talk to him. So he, he's like, "Yeah, I'm going out west," and like he comes back because I met this girl. I'm like, you know, and Zeb meeting a girl is like, no, no one's dealing with Zeb. So he's like, and I'm getting married. I go, wait a second. Have you just met this girl? We need to get married. So it went, and, and then finally, I found out she's an army. She was an army girl, right? Zeb? The, the Air Force. Air Force. And I, I go, Zeb, I go, you, like, you haven't, like, you, what are you getting married for? You know, like, what are you talking about getting married? You just met this girl. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. I, and I go, Zeb, I go, take your time. There's no reason to rush in to get married. And he's, no, no, we'll get married this week. And I go, Zeb, I'm not, like, I'm not going to be any part of this. And I told him that. Literally, this lasted. It lasted. I want to say nine months at the most, right? Yeah, so, yeah like a year. Yes. So the year. So like we didn't really talk during that year. The year comes up, and he comes back, and he called me, and he goes, "Yeah, I wanted to let you know first, it didn't work." I go, "What the hell did you expect, Zeb? Like, did you really think it was gonna work? You met the girl. You told you got married, and you, you weren't really with her because she was in the Air Force. It was a crazy story, right? Well, it was like I didn't want to be in my hometown. Like I was like, yeah, anywhere but here, right? 
And I was like, yeah, I don't want, I want to be anywhere but here. And then you, you got me the uh, Scott Blank. <laughs> yes. Like, hey, this guy, this guy is looking for an assistant coach. I'm like, okay. He's like, his name's Scott Blank. He was this crazy guy. I wrestled with him. He was a maniac. His brother wrestled here too. He's a real tough guy from Ashtabula. Yep. So I was like, he's like, here's his email. Send the guy an email. They're going to make a job for you. I was like, what? He said, they're going to make a job for you. I was like, what are you talking about? And this is back when jobs were hard to get. Really right? hard to get a job, yeah. right? Really hard I to couldn't get a job. Pass, remember, I couldn't pass the praxis. I couldn't pass yeah. the teaching exam. <laughs> yeah. And then <laughs> it was so awesome. When I finally figured out, someone was like, oh, yeah, all you got to do is write bullet points. Stop writing it uh, like open. <laughs> stop writing it like you're writing or answering every question. Just answer everything in a bullet point. As soon as I did that, I passed the <laughs> So I, 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 it was all contingent upon me passing. And Jim was like, yeah, this guy's got a job at Riverside High School. He's like, they need an assistant coach. Well, Blank's out of his mind. He's still out of his mind. A oh, great guy, though. Great, great, <laughs> great guy. guy. Give you the great shirt guy. he's wearing in a freezing, in a storm. Cor- that guy, storm, would give you, he would give you the last shred of clothing on his body and go out and yes. die in the snow. Yes. He's that type of guy, right? I still love this guy. He's an awesome guy. But it was all like this, like, real rough <laughs> patch of life and then jim was like yeah if you get married again uh, i'm not i'm not gonna be any part of it just so you know he goes, but we got this job we can get you this job and i was like okay so i went and i interviewed i interviewed and uh they hired me i passed the test and i'm still there so <laughs> and, and your jobs have gotten and jobs have gotten better correct yeah yeah i got a new job so got a new job this year right yeah, got That's a right. new job. They they made another job. So <laughs> they, must they, be doing they made right. another job. I'm not kidding. It's a great job. Yeah. So um it's one of the best places I've ever been, and I wouldn't change a thing about it. But it was all through connections through wrestling, right? It was you, yeah. hey, this guy needs an assistant coach. He sent me an email and I was like, All right. And no. Scott Blank, it'll make him better next time. Well, and you moved back in town, you needed a job, and you're getting you're getting divorced. I'm like, I'm not gonna be any part of anything else you're doing, but here's the job. Go interview with this guy, and you got a job. And then he told me, Jared, and then he told me, he goes, something about like, Zeb, you're like a wrestling hobo. Like told me I was a wrestling hobo. And he's like, I'm like, yeah, man, I, I, I don't know. He goes, Zeb, you guy gets back on the horse again. What are, you, what are you doing? And I'm like, yeah, I'm all sad. I don't want to deal with anybody. He goes, you're going to find some lady who's going to love you. So he kept saying, oh, she's going to be young. My wife is, you're younger than me. So, He's like, she's going to love you. She's going to treat you right. Trust me, it's going to work out. And Jim, Jim, you've been 100% right all the way. So <laughs> good work, Jim. Good, Jim. I can, I can give you a pat get, on the back right now. You're yeah. just getting started, restarted and wrestle with your little boys now getting going. Oh, my God. I, I, yeah, I bet, that'd be, that's, I bet that's a lot of fun. I didn't have boys. I you know, had girls. So it was, right. I, it's one of the things I'm jealous when I watch other wrestlers that are now coaching their boys. It's, it, it, so it, it seems like a lot of fun to do. I, I enjoy going to the practice because they do some, my kids do hilarious things, right? My thing is like um, this year, coach uh, Jeff Varney's the coach, the boys. And um, he's like, Hey, my son, Jeffrey, who's in between my two sons, he's five and Ferdinand and Thomas Ferd's about to turn six next year, early, early next year. He goes, Hey, Jeffrey wants to wrestle matches. Does Ferdinand want to? And I was like, well, I'll ask him. And he was like, no, I don't want to do that, Dad. I'm like, all right, you don't want to wrestle matches, we're not going to wrestle matches. And then the wind will change directions. They'll be like, hey, Dad, I think I want to watch – I'm going to go watch the big kids wrestle. And I want, if there's a match, I want to wrestle. So it's up to them. It's nice to leave it up to them. You know, like, I, if, hey, you guys want to go tonight? No? Okay, we're not going to go. I like that. I really enjoy that part of it. You know what I mean? Because I can take it or leave it, Jim. I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I, I find, you know, perception, I talk to a lot of people that are my age and they always thought my father was like a crazy wrestling guy. You know, he had a loud voice and scream, you know, you go to the match and yell and scream. But my dad was like, my dad's like, you start the season, you get a few roles. You're going to practice because you're on a team. And that's what you do. You start the season, you finish the season. If you don't want to wrestle something, you know, that's no problem with me. I, I don't have to take you anywhere, but like everyone thinks that he was this guy that made, you know, my brother has a little different perception of it too, because my brother didn't like wrestling as much as I did. So we'd go to all these tournaments every weekend when we were younger. My brother hated it. You know, I find this out later. My brother never really liked it or 
I just couldn't wait to, you know, every weekend I got to go to wrestle a tournament. I got to go somewhere and just sit in my house as a young kid. I used to love the idea of that as I got older, I just thought that that was like, I thought my brother loved it. I thought that, you know, I, my dad was never a crazy wrestling dad, but people always thought he was cause he was loud and, and he yelled really hard for me at matches. And, and, but you know, so it's just, it's just perception is so much. And, and I thought my dad handled wrestling as a father. Perfect. You know, as far as like, I see some fathers out there that, that I thought, Mr. Yeah. Op, you're dead. Ed, I, yeah. I believe my mom was, a, my mom was a crazy, <laughs> crazy mom. That's, yeah. So <laughs> no, she's and, awesome. And, but uh, yeah, yeah, Ed handled it right. But I, I had this conversation with Drew there, and I, I, we, we probably all three had a similar, you know, growing up, right? We had awesome parents, but like you felt like we were wrestlers, right? That was the thing. Like you, you didn't think of not doing it, right? It was just who we were. Yep. But it wasn't forced, right? Our parents didn't force it, but like you said, you're starting to finish it, but then as you go through the season, you probably like felt like I'm a wrestler, right? Yeah, hundred percent. And then it's like I'm going to do this next year because I'm I'm a re- and it's it's I feel like it's different than other sports, right? I mean, I don't know. I'm sure the Millers are the same way, but it's like there was no, you know, I'm sure some people were forced to do it, but it's like My, uh, mine's it's, a very different take. If you didn't play, <laughs> if you didn't play a sport, you had to work full time. So of course that's why I played three sports because then I didn't have to work. Work. So yeah. Might as well do it if you're gonna do it be good at it right like oh, you guys were all good track, no, was, track all. was easy because it was how i trained to wrestle my mom yeah. was just telling that story yesterday I don't, I don't know if big jim ever heard this one so we're at my daughter's uh swim meet yesterday and she's tiny and my mom's telling everyone in the crowd how like in, in junior high track and field like zeb's lapping me in the 800 <laughs> meter run <laughs> zeb was fast oh he's like he was really fast. a two-lap race i think he lapped me Oh, come on. My mom, my mom literally was telling the story yesterday. I think it was a mile. I definitely probably rather left in a mile. We got to, you got to tell the, the, the last, the last year of your career stories. When's that going to, I know it has happened today. Okay. Which, 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 when I was done and you called me? Well, you, you, you weren't wrestling because you're student teaching. We had Ben Rings who used to beat you up, right? Yeah. And then, so Ben, oh, Ring, yeah. okay. So I lost to Camargo. And then every time Rings and I would wrestle, it would just turn into a fist fight. And I remember I bust my eyes open all the time or bust his eye open. His eye, his Always turned into a fight. Thin skin. Thin skin. Yeah, thin skin. <laughs> Anyhow, um, so my fifth year, I was done, right? Like, it was just like, I was Student teaching. And I, I remember what happened um, in, I don't know if you remember what happened in Reno, Jim. Do you remember what happened in Reno? So I was wrestling. Drew, Reno. Drew almost missed the fight. Drew almost missed the fight. <laughs> okay. And Ramon, not, not when you Ramon thought it was my fault. I'm like, what do you mean? I'm not his dad. Not, not when you guys almost missed the flight. No, it wasn't me. It was Drew and Lensman. Yes, Drew and Lensman almost missed the flight. Correct. Oh. So we're in Reno, and there was a, it's that one-day tournament. I don't know if you've ever been back, Jim, have you? No, went one time. That was it. Because it's in, like, the cow arena, and it's cold, yeah. and there's potholes in the mat. It's terrible. Yes. Anyhow, it's my fifth year. I'm cutting a 184. I cut 20 pounds a day before. I go, like, two and two. I'm wrestling a guy from Oregon State. I'm winning and taking the guy down really easy. And I look over in the corner in the second period and Romano goes, you go down Miller. I'm like, no, I don't want to go down. I'm taking this guy down really easy. I want to go neutral. He's like, you go down. So I, I went down and this guy turns me twice and beats me up, like cracks my ribs and just mauls me. Right. So of course, what's the guy doing in the third period? Big stop. He's stop. He's stop. Right. And it got at one point, we went out of bounds for a mat return and he like slammed me down on the mat. I looked over at Romano and I was like, I told you I don't want to go down. And he like, for, do you, do you remember, I remember, this, I remember this? Yeah. I've never he heard just, this story. He like went insane on me. He's like, I'll throw in the towel and just MFing me from the corner. He was the craziest thing ever. So uh, the guy, Matt, returns me a couple more times. I finally get out. I take the guy down. I put him on his back. I end up winning the match. So rather than go over into the corner and get my stuff, I just walk away. I'm like, okay, I'm done. I'm good. I'm all set. And I'm walking through the, the arena in Reno, and I hear, I hear this. I hear. And it gets, like, loud. And I'm like, what is, what is that? And it's Romano running at me screaming. 
And he like grabs me by the arm and he's like, you don't ever talk to me that way. You're going to be a man someday. And your kids will talk to you like that way. And you're going to be a coach and you never talk to your coach like that. And I was like, listen, man, you just got to leave me alone. And he like, wouldn't leave me alone. He wouldn't let me walk away. And I was like, dude, just leave me alone, please. So, um, yeah, and I like broke my ribs and ended up losing the next match. And I was like, yeah, I don't even want to do this anymore. This sucks. It sucks, right? So I remember um, Mark Lensman, like I'm going back. I'm like, yeah, dude, I think I'm just done with this. I'm all set. I'm like old. My body hurts. Uh, yeah, I think I'm good. Mark Lensman pulls me aside in her house and he's like, Zeb, I suck. The only reason I'm on the team is because you're still on the team. You can't quit. <laughs> he goes, I suck. Because I was a backup the whole time I've been here. He's like, if you quit, why have I even stuck around? Why did I do this? And I was like, okay, I got to stick around. Now. I got to stick around now. I got to at least do it for Lensman, right? So I had the student teaching and I would go and I didn't get out of school till like 2.30 every day. And then Artie and Ramadani and Aaron Miller would work out with me. I don't know if you remember that, Jim, do you? Yep. So I'm cashed out, right? I am checked out. It is done. It is over. I got beat out. Camargo beat me out. Rings beat me out. And I'm eating hearty McDonald's. meals every day. <laughs> yeah. I'm 220 pounds, and I'm in my classroom the, the week before of the MAC tournament. I get a phone call. My student teacher, Nikki Marchman Boykman's like, hey, you got a phone call. I'm like, what? She's like, yeah, the receiver's laying on the chalkboard. Chalk tray. Go get it. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, hello. And Jim's like, hey, Seb, what's going on? And I'm like, uh, I'm just in the middle of teaching class. He's like, how much do you weigh? And I was like, why? He's like, you can wrestle 197 this weekend. I was like, dude, I weigh like 220 pounds. He goes, you got to make 197 one more time. He goes, rings got, rings got, uh, deployed. Deployed, got deployed to Iraq or like yeah. Africa or something. Right. Afghanistan. Yeah. Afghanistan, not Africa. Yeah. yeah. He got sent to Afghanistan. He yeah. won like a purple heart. Yep. He saved some people's lives in an embassy that caught on fire. And you, Jim's like, you got to wrestle. I was like, dude, I'm, I'm 23 pounds overweight. He's like, you better make that weight. And I was like, all right. And guys, this is just also with, with no, this wasn't cell, we had no cell phones back then. So I called no. like from my office phone. And yeah. And he called, called the day. school, the classroom. I phone. called every number. Then finally, I got, at your classroom, I got a hold of your classroom. Yeah. But it was like with a, it's just, it's, it's times are so much different. Yeah, it was on natural so phone we called. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. You called me in the classroom. And you, you, that's the year you took third, isn't it? No. The third's the year you made me wrestle for true second. Okay. Well, you did really well at this time. I, yeah. The, I lost to like Sermon Era. Yeah. I but it was Sermon Era. Yeah. I lost to like, and I lost an overtime match. I lost to Sermon Era by a point and then I lost an overtime match. But you wrestled really well. You're like, I remember at the end of it, you're like, dude, I, I don't think I could have asked any more from you. No. You, were like, you left it all out there. I was like, yeah, I'm just not very good. <laughs> He's like, no, you're not, but you fought real hard. <laughs> That's awesome. I never yeah. knew the, uh, the Reno side. I knew the other half of it. I knew the uh... – Dude, the Reno thing was crazy. Yeah. He, like, went nuts on me. But, like, I mean, I will say that. Like, the best thing that I, I didn't quit. I'm glad Mark Lundsman, you know, snapped me back to reality and was like, Dude, I've sucked forever. You're the only reason I stayed on the team. I was like, okay, I think I owe that. You remember that Mark Lensman used to beat the crap out of out of Nemetho in the room. The, in the room, the, right? Room all room. star. And he knew that. Like, I think he knew that, but he just, it, yeah, he, he was great in the room. He just, he, yeah. you know, back well, then. I've seen that a lot, though, right? As a coach, seen the, like, Ross, the guys in the room and then yeah. they get in front now, of them. It's Nowadays, you kind of understand it a little bit more because of so much, you know, so much mental health things out there. And you're like, right. all right, this guy, you know, this, this guy's he's dealing with something. Back then, you just like, I don't think Mark Lensman had any, he just had a lot of anxiety probably or something that back then you didn't really diagnose it with, right? I don't know what the exact yeah, words And I think the other, thing, the other thing, Jim, with him is, um, and I think that, like, you always said this about St. Edwards and St. Paris Graham guys, they're really good. Those yeah. coaches, those guys are already being coached by Division One, like top ten type coaches. Yeah. So it's like, how much better can those guys get? I mean, they're training all summer. They're going to camp. It's a way of life. They're living it. They're not even playing any other sports. It's it's like, how much better can those guys get? Whereas Jared had a lot of upside left, even though he was a four time state champ. You yeah. know, I probably had upside left. 
like you have upside, you have legs. I don't know how much, but you know, like you're going to obviously have your David Taylors and you're going to have the Alex Marinelli's, but if you look at the Graham guys and you look at the St. Ed's guys, they're super coached up. Those guys are all college ready. Like, don't, don't be surprised if those guys come in as true freshmen or redshirt freshmen and all Americans because they're red. I don't know how much more they got left, but they're ready. And those coaches are so good. John Hepburn is so good. Yeah. Jeff Jordan's so good. They're so, they're amazing coaches. Yeah. So that's something you probably got to look at it when you're recruiting those guys because they have such, they are so, and then Mark Lundman fell into that because he did the Jordan camps all summer. Then he worked the Jordan camps all summer, yeah. every summer, right? So there was no break from wrestling. No, none so, at all. No, none at all. And it's like, you know, they really got to love it. And, and then, you, you know, there's all these other things you're saying. There's mental health stuff. Are they doing it for themselves? Are they doing it for their parents? Yeah. You know, yeah. like what we are just referred to is, we did it because it was wrestling, right? And we did it was a part of our family, right? Like, yep. that's why we did it. But like, those guys are in these communities where there's a lot of pressure, I think. Right. Oh, yeah, 100 percent. So speaking yeah. of coach, right? Coach uh, Bob Lemieux still right at, at Kent, right? Bob is still <laughs> there. Talking yeah. about Kent State, right? Is he still the Bob is, coach for the team or what? He's still the head. He's the head strength coach now. So he's in charge of the whole program, and it's, you know it's called strength and conditioning. And, and they had another word to make it sound really fancy, but uh, he's still there, and he does he does wrestling, women's basketball, and the golf sports, and, and he kind of oversees a lot of it now. But he he's never let go of wrestling, and he our guys love Bob. But back mm-hmm. back when he was there, there was some resistance, I think, especially our really good teams. Nick, uh, little Nick, Nick Bailey didn't like the lift. Mitchup wasn't a, a huge lifter. Kilgore, he lifted, but Kilgore was just so like man strong that he didn't. Right. Matt strong. He was Matt doing strong. it. Right. Yeah, he was. He was. You know. So so those guys gave, gave a little bit of resistance. Now Bob, our guys love lifting and they and they love the workouts and and Bob has kind of changed a little bit. He does a lot of, lot of uh, just making sure your body's strong for competition, which is a little bit different than what we used to do back then. I think, like I said, we've learned so much now from you know like, what our trainers know and what our strength coach knows now compared to 15 years ago so much different it's Everything crazy how different it evolves yeah yeah like we hate it like i never wanted my guys like when i first started like don't go to the training room you go in there they're gonna unless you have to go in there don't go in the training room if you walk into our i don't think either one of you seen it our new training room is like uh it's one of the it, we got a, chiro, a cryo machine in there oh, it's nice. one of the best training facilities in the country because they just redid it um it's amazing it's it's incredible and now like our guys go in there for for cold baths, they go in there to get treatment. And you actually, you're, you're telling, especially young guys, get in the, get in the training, make sure you're getting ice on your body, make sure you're getting, you know, STEM if you need it, take care of your bodies because the season's so long and we just know so much more now than we did back when, when we competed or when you guys competed and when I competed. Right. Right. That's crazy. Now, Bob, yes. man, he, he was good to me. I, I liked him. Tell him yeah. I like Bob. I'm a fan of Bob. I like Bob. I always enjoyed lifting. I was weak as a kitten though. Jim, you remember <laughs> telling me that? Yeah. Oh yeah, I Miller, know. you're fat and you're weak as a kitten. And I was like, those are probably fair points. Those are probably fair points. I think that those. Oh. I remember you think you told Simmons that too. <laughs> Simmons, you're weak as a kitten. What about like? I know this had to come from Nick Nemeth. Nick Nemeth used to come to practice. And like this is when I was assistant coach. And this, not that this was part of the problem, but he used to go in the corner and do WWE stuff with with Sean Wentz. I used to go off in the corner. And there was like, and they'd, we they'd drill, play, they, and they'd play grab ass. They, they, they was, yeah. well, is that right? And he was our best guy on our team at, for the most part. It was right. right. I used to right. just sit and shake my head because it, like it went on in our room, you know, but it's kind of crazy. Told the joke last week. He did oh, a dude. stone cold stunner to me one day and Frank Romano literally watched him do it. <laughs> Frank Romano did an about face, did a, did a one eighty, and just walked the other way and act like it didn't happen. <laughs> He literally told this joke like it's not the, the sad thing is it's not even a joke. It's a real it's thing that happened. You're confirming it. He told it last week at the stand up comedy show at the Odeon yep. and yep. it happened. That's the I can't believe it totally happened. Yep. Oh, my God. How wild is that? Yep. yep. And, 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 then, well, and then he then he got the, and then he had the bad shoulder. I think it was his junior year, maybe his friend or so. And. I had to drill with him because he couldn't, no one else would go with him because he didn't want him to get hurt. So I drilled with him literally the last like five weeks, five weeks of the season. He worked, he only worked out with me, no one else but me. Um, I might've been his senior year, maybe his year, whatever year he had surgery. Um, 
but I had to work out with him every day because we didn't want Sean hurting him anymore. Cause Sean was the one who hurt him in the corner doing whatever, the, what it is he does. And the way yeah, he wrestled. Goofing off. Yeah. Goofing yeah. off. Yeah. Yeah. What a bunch of psychopaths. <laughs> what a bunch of psychopaths. Hey, I, I tell you what, I will it. say that about him. He was he tough. He was doing, Nick Nemeth was tough. He knew what he was doing though. He knew he was going to do yeah. it. He was going to do it yeah. hard. It was a limited yeah. arsenal, but he did it and yeah. couldn't stop it. What I'm saying is he was, he was literally getting ready for his career right. in the back corner of the wrestling room. And now he's a W he was a, you know, he's yeah. a WWE champion of the world. So he knew what he was doing. Yeah. It was just as a wrestling coach, you're like, what's this guy doing, man? Like he's not, those aren't wrestling moves. He's working out. Those are you know, fake. I, it's fake. It's <laughs> theater. That's theater. <laughs> what he's doing. Yeah. Oh yeah. I yeah. love it. Like when you bring it up, I'll be like, Oh, Gable Stevenson's amazing. And he's like, yeah, but this is fake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm yes. like, yeah, he'll kill everybody. He's like, yeah, he probably will, but this is fake, so don't worry about it. <laughs> so, Jim, um, when you go from being a head coach and you guys are a joke for however many years, right? And then you become like a serious, real thing, right? You start having all Americans. You got five guys that could be all Americans, and one year, two of them do it. What is that? What was it like? What was the reception like with people? Now they're not talking behind behind your back and talking, <laughs> right? What yeah. was that like? What was that like to get the the? I did something right. We're doing the right things here. It was a culture change. But when you got the validation and you guys finally kicked the wall down and Jermail gets the job done, and Nick Badlion gets the job done, was there any doubt in your mind you couldn't have a national champ within like five years? Well, I, when Kilgore got there, and, and you know, even after his first year, when he didn't have the success that he wanted at the national champ, we knew that he was going to like. We knew this was the guy. Like he knew that just how he did things, and even you know, he went his freshman year. He won like fifty matches in his first two years, so we knew he was good. He had beaten Simas in open tournaments as a freshman. Simas was an All American his second year, so we knew it. It just, you know, like I said, to win a national title, though, you gotta. You got to be really good that weekend. You got to have a little bit of luck and you got to be healthy. And Dustin wasn't that healthy his first year because he cut so much weight. And that's why he didn't have the success he wanted. His second year, he made a comment to me his second year after it was over that, that he was really nervous and he was just glad he, glad he placed. And I'm like, Dustin, you, you were in the quarterfinals. You were winning the match against the guy who was in the final, who got the guy who made it to the finals. I go, you were better than him. And I go, you're just glad you're an all American. So he never really believed it either, honestly. I knew that I thought he could be a finalist his freshman year his, or his sophomore year. And he was just glad to be an all American. So at that point, it, like it kind of hit me. But after that year, when he was an all American, I'm like, Dustin, you need to be competing for an, a, a national title or you don't have your mind. Right. I go, you're that good. And he looked at me, he goes, yeah, next year we're going to do it coach. And I go, I'm being serious. Dustin. He goes, I know you are. I'm being serious back. And, and literally that next year he had two losses where he looked horrible at the Southern scuffle. He, he looked amazing. He beat the uh, Pasillo. He, he beat Simez in at the um, body bar tournament, which we used to go to. He did really bad in the middle of the season. And then we actually let him, we backed off on him a little bit. So we gave him some time off and just let his bot, like he was so just go, go, go all the time that his freshman year, we went, we, we didn't give him enough time off and he, he peaked too early. So at that point, we, me and Matt had some conversations like, all right, he goes to her. We need to back him off. And then we got him to peak again for the national tournament. And, you know, I, nowadays you'll see it, but back then you didn't see many 97 pounders matches like you did when him and Simon was playing. They wrestled twice and they scored a total of like 50 or yeah, like 55 points in two matches for upper weights, which you didn't see. And they were takedowns and, you know, it was, it, they were crazy matches and you didn't see that from big guys. Now you see it a little bit more because we're a little bit more athletic and we're, we, we've evolved as a sport, but it was, you know, he, he, he put it all together. And even in the finals, I, I've watched that match a few times recently. It, it, you know, just how he wrestled was so hard and intense that, that he did it. And it was great. And then next year he got, you know, two years later, he got to the finals again, which, um, you know, people's like, well, how come he lost? And I'm like, he lost to a guy that was a three-time national champ or a three-time finalist and a two-time champ. I go, the kid, kid was pretty good himself, you know? So yeah, that's, that's what happens when you're that good. You beat other guys, you get to wrestle other guys that are that good too. So, you know, it, it I think we knew it. I think at that point, other guys believed in it and, yeah, I think Ian was on that team maybe his last year. Does that sound about right? Yeah, Ian and him were together for, for because he Olympic red shirted and then they were together for 2013. Okay, yeah. Because Ian wrestled the one year, the year that uh, Dustin Is, Olympic red shirted. Ian yes, was a freshman. Yes, and then we red shirted him, and that's when also um, Bedley on like we got to wrestle Ian. We got three guys here because we had Kilgore and also Bedley on, and and he and but I didn't think. I didn't think Ian 
I think he needed that redshirt year. And you agreed with me. Yeah. After his I freshman he, year, yeah, we sat down and I'm like, you need a redshirt. You need to you need to tight, tighten up some things. Yeah, it ended up working out for him. I mean, he's yeah. a three time All American after the redshirt year, and he's you know the only guy to ever be in the top six three times. So yep, he yep. did something right, and I think he was in such good weight classes too. But um, yeah, oh yeah, Hill Hill told the story that Ian and Kilgore were training for Akron. <laughs> Yep. And they were like, Hill was like, yeah, he said, let's go takedowns. He said he inside tripped Kilgore to his back twice. Yep. And then the third time Kilgore just almost like crushed him and hurt him. <laughs> yeah, that's hundred percent right. He's like, he said he inside tripped Kilgore to his back and he was, he was 155 pounds. Yep. Kilgore was 220. Yep. And he said he just ran an inside tripped him. Yep. Twice. Now, Oh my God. He goes, then, we, he, then he got Goonie on him. He got like, yeah. you know, like he was playing with a toy trying to murder it, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> and that was year we had two guys that won the U twenty threes, which, uh, you know, it, yeah, him and him and Ian and Kilgore won the U twenty threes. And there were, we were the only, we were the only program at that event that had two champs, Kent state. That was it was, crazy. you know, yeah. Were those the two guys that got you into freestyle, Jim? Were those the two big freestyle guys? Well, Kilgore never wrestled freestyle in high school. Kilgore's first freestyle was with us, but wow. we just felt it was part of the process. Like you know, as soon as as soon as I became head coach, we 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 started tra- training for U23. So everyone went. The first two years it was in uh, Chicago, so we had to go to Chicago. Then they moved them to Cleveland, and it got a lot easier. Um, but my first two years of coaching, we went to Chicago where they you know they held them and. It was just what we felt had to happen to get our guys that, you know, when we wrestled Zeb, if you think about it, it was almost like a, you know, it was almost like I mean, there was no preseason. There was no postseason. It was just wrestling. It seemed like we're now we start the first day of school. We end June 23rd after you 23s are over. We give them about two weeks off and we get them back for our camps and then spend the rest of July and August training to get ready for the next season. So long. Yeah, it is. Such a, I it mean, is. the way when you put it like that, it is so long. <laughs> Someone said it to me, like a person was like, yeah, my kid wants to go D1. And I'm like, it's so long. It's so hard. It's so, you know, my nephew is at App State now um, with Ian, my nephew Wyatt, and he's a grinder. And, you know, he's he's hitting the part of the season where he's having a hard time keeping weight on. You know, it's the holiday. It's tough. This is tough. It's, it's so tough. And I don't think people really understand just how tough it is it's yeah. really 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 hard to do the season's so long you're trying to build depth you'll go in and you know i was a walk-on i fought real hard i remember i fought real hard as a walk-on and think about that you got scholarship guys full ride guys who you're kicking their ass and you're a walk-on right yeah. and they got to be like what the what is going on and then you start to second guess you know this is hard yeah. It's really hard. It's like you're in Reno in a cow arena and this guy's screaming at you, running you down. <laughs> you're in your fifth, you're in your fifth year, and you're like, why am I even doing this anymore? This yeah. sucks. Yeah. It's tough. You know what I mean? It, I tell every recruit that walks out of campus, I go, This will be the, the five hardest years of your life. And then when you get as soon as you get out of college, you then it becomes really tough and you wish you were back doing the thing that was the hardest when you were doing it when you're in college. So you know, being a college athlete is really, really difficult. It's really hard, and but like you said, there's some things that can come out of it that are, that are life changing. Like look at your whole life, Seb, and I, you know, and we joke around about it, but your whole life is based on being a, a, a Kent State wrestler, Kent State alumni. A lot of things, your job, your, your girlfriend, yeah, yeah, my wife, my what kids. you do, your kids, yeah, everything. So it's just you know, I wouldn't change it though. I, I, I you know what I mean? Like when you all, say that, all the BS, right? <laughs> yeah, all worth it. It was totally yeah. worth it. It's all worth it. Like everything I look at it now, I wouldn't have my, it's like awesome to think about. Like I, I makes me happy. You know what I mean? I really yep. enjoy it. So that, that's awesome. I, I, Jim, do you think parents don't get it? Cause like Ed, Ed and Julie Opper maybe didn't get it. Right. They didn't get it. You know, they were, they were, they didn't go to college. They knew their kid was good. Right. Like Jared, yeah. you, like your parent, you was all first. Now I was the fourth right, of right. four, right? Was the first time through, and I, I mentioned this before, but you were a big reason, right? I, I visited Kent. You, know, you kind of walked me through. Here's what it is. You didn't sugarcoat it, Zeb, right? And that was a big reason. I was like, all right, this is what it is. It wasn't a recruiting trip where it's like, you know, a sales pitch. Zeb, you laid it out for me. And you know, I was like, you know, that's where I felt comfortable, right? Do parents we, get it, Jim? 
do parents get like how hard this is process is going to be for them? I think so. I, I try to, when they come on visits, like we, you know, we signed, we ended up signing like 11, 12 kids. Right. And I tell all the parents, I go, what your son is going to about to do is going to be hard and they need support. And so I, you hope they do, but I don't think they understand truth. Like when we have kids make visits now, it isn't, you know, I hear about some of these other visits that kids go on. I just laugh because kids make their decision based on a 24 to 48 hour visit. They go there, they probably go to a football game. They go out with, you know, they, they, I could tell a Cody Walder story. I could, I can't tell it on this air, but I could tell a Cody Walder story that why he went to OU compared to Kent. And it makes, it, it makes me giggle just because the visits are so unrealistic to what you're going to be doing for the next five years. We literally have kids that when we'd have them on visits. I tell my guys, I'm like, listen, you're not to go out. You stay in the dorm. You're going to show them around. We try to do them on either Thursday nights or Sunday nights because the next day we get up for lifting. And I want my guys to know that, all right, it's a Thursday night and we have to get up for lifting at 630 or it's a Sunday night and we have to get up for lifting on Monday morning. So they know that yeah, not much is going to happen, but because you're, you're, a, you're a college athlete that, that's competing and this is what we do. We lift three days a week at 630. Nothing changes throughout the whole year. That's, that's the one consistent thing. We'll change our practices. We'll do different things, but you're going to be with Bob three days a week, your entire, the entire season, sometimes four weeks if we can squeeze in it in the fall. And you're going to be up at 630 in the morning lifting <laughs> no matter what. So I want my, my recruits to know that because, you know, it isn't the, the parties or the frat party or the, the, the bar that you go to on your visit or the football game. I, Ohio State kids, they go to one football game in their career probably. And that's on their visit because they can't get tickets to go into the time when they go, when they go there. So, it, it, you know, you, you hear about all these kids that go there and they got, I got to go to the football game. It was great. I can't wait to go to Ohio State. And they get to the school and they can't get tickets because they're so hard to get. That's, that's reality. Reality isn't going to that game on the visit. They so might give are, them like one game a year and it's like Maryland or something, but they're not, they're not going to football games every weekend. When they're playing Kent state, they get to go. Yeah. They get to go to that game or whatever, whatever Ohio team they're playing. They're not. Yeah. That's what's crazy. Like they'll, they do get to go to a game as like athletes and be on the field, and, but it's like, they're not going to, they're not going to six home games. No. Yeah. And, and not no. to mention they grind. They grind yeah. hard and they're practicing yeah. in the morning and they don't even have the go juice to go to a football game. It's tough. Yeah, exactly. It's tough what, they're, what people are doing. And I just don't know if people get just how tough when you say D one, it's, it's no joke, man. It's no yeah. joke. It's the real deal. And whether you're prepared for it or not, I mean, you're, you're going to figure it out one way or another. You know what I mean? You're going to figure it out. <laughs> one way. It might not be good. You might be in the convocation center getting screamed at telling that your team needs you to, to win the championship, uh, but they don't score the true second place match. But, you know, you'll figure that out in 20 years. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that'd be got anything else closing in, in an yeah. hour here. This uh, is a long one. We talked about nothing for an hour. We did, we did this like Seinfeld. Yeah. <laughs> Jim, what, what I guess uh, parting parting shots. Where are you guys at next? Who can you look? For? Let's talk Kent State wrestling. How about that, Jared? Can we get a little Kent State wrestling besides yeah. glory? I try to steer it that way. I asked about Bob. I'm trying to get, get back on track. Here. We we, yeah, we, we got a really got, good dual team. We're, it was the best team we'll have had in probably four or five years since the the Ian Miller De Palma team. I think this will be our best team. Um, we don't have anyone that really sticks out right now, but we we got some guys that I think that by the end of the year we'll we'll end up on top and hopefully get to the national tournament. But uh, uh, you got Jake Ferry at 125, who's he's been ranked, he's ranked as low as 18th. He's had some losses, but you know, he's one of those guys that starts off slow. I'm not too worried about him. Um, we got a transfer from Pitt that uh, it was an Ohio guy, Fenton, who uh, who's our 33 pounder. Um, took second last week at, at a tournament, was like the seventh seed, and ended up taking third. So, beat some guys he wasn't supposed to, which is always good. Uh, we got Louis Noel from he's a Pittsburgh transfer as well. From uh, he was at 125 pounder, and they like. He's like, yeah, I can't go 125 anymore. And they're like, well, then you're gonna, we're going to take your money. So then he ended up transferring us and he turned into our 141 pounder. He's probably the most savviest kid on our team, knows the most about wrestling and, and understands the sport, every position, the, the best out of anyone. I mean, it might not be our best guy, but he understands how to wrestle on top and on bottom, which Ohio guys struggle at it. He knows he's just a very savvy wrestler. When he fills out and becomes a true 141, I think we're really, really good. Um, Cody Kamara is in his like 19th year at a, as our 149 pounder. Um, <laughs> he's actually, a, he's a fifth year guy and he's going to wrestle in a sixth year next year. So he's going to get, he's going to take his extra year because he loves it. He's getting his master's degree. Um, he's a returning qualifier too, right? Returning national qualifier. Um, we got, uh, Enrique, which Zeb told me that he's a, he's the meanest kid, you'll, the meanest wrestler. He's actually the nicest, 
he's probably one of the nicest freshmen we've ever had as far as just do you know him well Zeb? Enrique? Enrique Munguia? Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you know him well? I mean, I know him from the, the Burnett camps and I know that he's just like this ultra competitor. Ultra. He, was he I wants, right? He ultra, was ultra, I and, right? And he's, yes, you're right. And he, he's mean on the mat, but you talk to him, he's the most nicest kid that you'll soft ever spoken. meet. Soft spoken, almost like afraid of coaches, it seems like. And I'm starting to get him to laugh and feel comfortable. And, and now he's asking questions more. And he's just, a, he's just a great kid. He's going to be really good. I mean, probably could have used a red shirt, but he's our best guy. And he wanted to compete. So we're like, all right, you know, that was part of the deal. He's like, if I'm the best guy, do I get to wrestle next year? We're like, yeah. Well, normally a kid like him, you might want a red shirt because he's really, really good, but he's, he's raw. He's very green at some things that he's getting better at, but he's, it's just, there's gonna be a learning curve for him. And when he figures it all out, you better watch out. He's going to beat someone really good this year. Oh yeah. He's yes, going to beat 100%. like a top 10. He'll pin a top 10 guy or something. He's he, and he's, he wrestles in positions that you don't want to be in usually. And, he, and he's yeah, really he might blow the there. person's knee out while he's at it. 100%. 100%. He, he's just super competitive. Yep. And you can never count that guy out of a match. I like him. What about 65? 65 is uh, Najee Lockett, another tra- Cornell transfer. He's got a lot of transfers. Cornell transfer was, a, I want to say, a two time finalist. And in, in, in between there, he didn't get to wrestle one year. That was his, the, the COVID year. So sophomore year was a finalist, I believe. And then his junior didn't get to wrestle in the senior he lost, round. Yeah, he lost to Karshala in the finals. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's real good. He I'm a big fan of Najee Lockett. I've known Najee Lockett since he's, he's a, like a little kid. He's been – they're both Burnett guys. Najee's yes. a Burnett guy, and so is Mungia. And, and once again, uh, really nice kid. Hasn't wrestled. Hasn't had a knee injury. Hopefully we'll get him – he, he would be ready, ready to wrestle at Vegas when we go there, but he, we're just not going to send him to Vegas for his first competition. But he's really good. He's, I think he's a guy that will surprise a lot of people. Just his style is so much different than most college wrestlers. And we got another transfer named Michael Ferraro. He's an he's a Ohio guy who came back with the Campbell. Um, when uh, what's his name went to uh, Navy, he wasn't a big Sentez fan and started looking at places and he wanted to come closer to home and he came to us and he's actually wrestled really, really well so far for us. I think once again, loves the sport, loves to learn. Like he's a, he's a, he takes notes. He brings a notepad to practice. He comes in and watch films and he's a true, he's a true, he understands the sport and wants to get better at it. He's one of these guys. It's like, this guy's going to be good just because he works so hard and, and he wants to be really good. Um, McCracken, fifth year guy, 197. Uh, Bates. Wait, wait, wait. McCracken's down to 84. 84. McCracken's down to 84. Wrestled 97. Qualified down last year at 97. Wrestled AJ Ferrer at the NCAAs. Yes, he did. Yep. He, and first now match, he's down to 84. Down to 84 where he should have been other years. He just, you know, so he's down there. And then Bates went from 84 to 97. And then we have Jacob Cover, who's our heavyweight. Like I said, it's the best dual team we'll have in a long, in, in a long, in a lot of years, I think. So I'm excited about the year. Um, we got a lot of guys that are kind of unknown a little bit, a lot of transfers that, that have left to come back to Ohio because mainly because of the, the COVID and just how much things cost and wanting to be closer to home than where they went originally. And I think we're one of those programs that really benefited from the, the transfer thing. If you look at who, you know, who's in our line, who's in our lineup, just because they wanted to come back home during this whole COVID situation. So we said we ended up signing 11 kids. We, we lost. So two years ago, we lost, all our scout, we lost 50% of our scholarships. We went from 9.9 scholarships to five scholarships like that. So we have to write our scholarships and they have to be in, in the athletic department by June 28th. The 25th, my AD gets me on a phone call and tells me that I have to go from 9.9 to five scholarships. I'm like, well, how do you want me to do that? I got kids, kids, and he goes, I don't care. You're that coach, figure it out. That AD is no longer with us, as you can tell why. Um, but you know, we had to literally cut our scholarships in half. We had to t- I told every, almost every kid on our team that we're cutting your scholarship in half because we were at 9.9. We went to five. That means everyone had to get half the money they were getting. A lot of kids stuck through it. Um, we had one kid that couldn't do it financially, couldn't make it. He went back home. That was Earl Blake. And then every other kid came back. And then uh, next year, we're getting all our scholarships back. So we had a lot of money to recruit with. We ended up signing about, like I said, we got about 11 kids signed so far for next year. So it's really exciting. We got a coach back in, in, uh, um, uh, Malik McDonald, who big guy, another soft-spoken coach. You talk about he's as soft-spoken as you get as a coach. It's, it's kind of bizarre with my personality and his personality. It's a, it's two different mixes that we've never had. Me and Matt, me and Matt are very similar. Matt Hill, Danny's not soft-spoken when he get, but when he gets a little grumpy, and he, you know, he's, he's he gets at guys. Where Malik's just really, really soft-spoken. Comes over and you know, give you the old rub on the, you know, rub your back type of thing, rather than he just he just operates a little bit different, which is great for, for what we. We lack in some areas. You need that in a room, right? Though some yeah. contrast, right? 
Yeah, hundred percent, thousand. I agree. Yeah, it, it makes a difference. And our guys got nowadays. Guys, will, not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just so much different than you know. I wasn't rubbing anyone's back 15 years ago. I wasn't walking up to Dustin Kilburn and rubbing his back and telling him it's gonna be okay. You know, it just didn't happen. We didn't. How it worked is not how the it, sport works. It, it, yeah. Now <laughs> nowadays it does, and yeah. the kids need that and they want that, and it's important. Which you know, if it's important, ultimately we're about trying to get our student athletes, you know, to be to have great experiences and be successful. Um, and if, if kids need that nowadays, which they do, it's pretty apparent. And that's what we're here for. So it's a big part of our job now. Jim, when's the last time you told someone they were fat and weak as a kitten? <laughs> I haven't. I can't remember the last time I yelled at our guys. My, like, I got a bunch of really good guys, you know, academic. We, we've, for some of the years in the past we've lacked in, in wrestling, we've had like some really, really good academic teams. We've been in the top 10 the last like six years in a row as far as academic all teams. So you, you kind of give up some things. The smarter kids you have, the less problems you have. So if you can, you know, if you think about it, you're getting educated kids would come from really good families that are smart and they come, they're, they're doing the same thing academically. They might not be as good as wrestlers, but we have, I have less, I have half the problems than I've ever had. And, and now, you know, they're, they're all really good guys. And, and it's just, it's a little bit different environment now than it used to be. And, and I really enjoy, it. I enjoy the guys on our team. I enjoy, you know, how much they want to learn, how, how important they see the academics. Very seldom do I have to get on them about academics. It's, it's really strange compared to what I used to worry about. What's uh what's the next country concert? I, I bumped into uh, you a couple of times this summer, right? What, we, yeah, we coming up. We didn't see it. We didn't see you come come back because they redid that one. It rained. I know we didn't make it back. We had some conflicts. I was bumped because we had really good seats for that one. I was kind of did. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. Bummed, but uh, but uh, we ne- made, we uh seen a few more, but not that one. But you got anything on the horizon or next summer? Or anything you're looking at? Next summer, my. My daughter and my wife are big country, like country ah, music fans. That's where yeah, I saw you. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know any. I, I like live performance. I like seeing people perform. It's almost, same, it's same. a lot like wrestling. You know, you got guys out there performing. These guys are, they're doing great at what they do. And when you, you watch a live, person, it's different than watching that TV. Hundred percent. Like yeah. even listening on the radio. Like yes, I don't like the song. You go to a concert, it's great. They're, you know, they're. Right. And, and who do we? Who was that guy we saw? Uh, that was uh, we went over the. Uh, with uh, our friends it was uh for her uh their anniversary thomas rett we were like thomas we were, rett. Up front. We were like up front yeah he's like the he's like a performer of all performers when it comes yeah, to yeah. Like how he, taking pictures grabbing doing facetime yeah, right? like yeah, all kinds right. of stuff. he's great he was really yeah. awesome yeah. yeah jim how many more years how many more years can you do this well he, head wrestling so, coach kent state university <laughs> how much longer you got i just signed another contract so I have two years and two years I can officially retire from Kent State University. I don't see myself retiring in two years, but I, I don't know how much longer after that I'll go. It, like I said, a lot of things will have to work out. Um, I, you know, it, it, it'll, it'll, it'll come down to a lot of things. Deb. So, but I did just sign a two-year contract, which, uh, um, which will take you through retirement age though. You can retire after two years and be done. I'm a state of Ohio employee that's in category B. It's the age 52 and at least 30 years. I'll have 33 years and I'll be 52. So if I, you know, because of the category, you had to be 52 and you have to have 30 years. I'll have 33 years and 50. So I'm going to get three years above the 70%. So I'm going to get 77.5% of my, you know, three best average years for the rest of my life. Nice. So, <laughs> yeah. So, nice. Okay. Hey, stick around a little longer than that. You know, it, it, it depends. It depends on a lot of push things. it up to over 80% of, of your high, highest five years. That's pretty good. Yeah. Really yeah, good. Like I said, we have a really good AD. If you would have the other AD, if he was still here, I would have said, please get me through these next two years and then I, I'll go away. And I'll, you know, the, the old AD, he did not like wrestling. Um, he, he wasn't, he wasn't good for a person like myself. And, and, you know, my thing is, is we, I, I, I believe I worked really hard at this job for a lot of years. And he, he just, everything was no to him. And, you know, and I'll give you an example. So for example, when we started, when we started getting really good, we started having camps and we, we use that camp money to pay, uh, to pay a volunteer assistant. So we were paying like $29 a night for a kid to sleep in the dorm. Our guys were getting in trouble. Every summer was a nightmare with his camps. So I walked in the AD's office. I said, listen, let me run my camps in the field house and let me dorm them there. And the AD looked at me and goes, why would you want to do that? And, you know, he's an older guy. And I go, I can keep my guys under control. They can't leave the building. They can't go anywhere. They're there. I go, plus I'm going to pay dorming fees. And we worked out a negotiation and it was the, the greatest thing. We, you know, we saved about $29,000 in 
in money that now I had the ability to be able to use for my, my program, where before it was going in dorming costs. My guy loved it. At that point, we expanded our camps, made it a little longer. Football coaches were all pissed off. The AD goes, listen, this guy's bringing in $250,000 a year. You know, he's running camps. It's good for our program. It's good for his program. It's funding a lot of what he does. Great. We did it. We did it. All of a sudden, this new AD comes in and he says, you get in the camps for five days, uh, a Thursday night through a Tuesday or whatever, and that's it. And I'm like, we just make all this money, help support this. He goes, I don't care about that. And I'm like, what do you mean you don't care? Like, that, you know, we, you should care. And he didn't care. And it was, it was his way or the highway. Now we have another AD that pretty much comes in and it's like, Hey, what can you do to help this program? Not just, you know, in, in everything, like finances are important. What are you going to do to help it? Uh, how, how are you going to help your budget out? And those things, I, I think I've really, really excelled in at Kent City as far as our budget. When I came, we had $0 in our, in our wrestling endowment. We're at like $2.1 million of wrestling endowment. That's money that we've raised. It's there. We, we function off the, the money that we get every year off, but which yeah, it's a pretty big deal. Most people don't even know that about our program. But when I got when I started off coaching, we had zero dollars in our endowment. Jim, talk about real quick what what kind of happens at the end of November for Kent State University and what you guys are trying to do to to, to raise funds. So November thirtieth. So this is you know November is like the giving month. They start at the beginning of the year, at the beginning of the month. It goes on the thirtieth, and that's actually Giving Tuesday. So on November November thirtieth, we are having a. We're going to have a crowdfunding day. We're trying to get 450 unique donations of $25 or more. And, you know, you're saying 450, 450 people to give. That's a lot. How are you going to do that? And I'm like, well, if you think about all the kids that have come through the program with me or before me, $25 nowadays isn't a whole lot of money. So we're literally, I've been sending out texts. I've been, I've been sending out emails. We're hoping to get 450 people to give 25 bucks. 25 bucks will actually turn into 75 bucks at the end of the night because the university doubles it on that day and they have something called this, this boost. So for every 20th, $25 donation, unique donation you get, the university gives you a $500 boost on top of that. So if you add that all up for every $25 a person gives at the end of the day, it's going to be worth $75 towards our program. So our goal is to get 450. If we end up getting 450 people to do that, you know, we'll be above the $40,000, which is our goal. Um, and like I said, do I, no one thinks it's going to happen. Uh, so we're just kind of, we haven't raised a lot. We raised 15,000 the first like four or five days of the month. And we did that on purpose because they did some matching and things. We haven't raised anything. So all these other sports have kind of caught up and it's a competition within our, in the university. We want to see which sport can raise the most money. And I, I just keep telling people, just, you know, give us that last day. It's all we need. So we're going to, all my guys will be making phone calls on, on that Tuesday from five o'clock until eight o'clock. If you're a Kent State wrestling fan, look for your phone call. You get to talk to one of my guys and, like I said, we're asking for a, a minimum of 25 bucks, a simple $25 donation right at the bat will turn into to, to 75. If you want to give us a thousand, that'll turn into 2000, but that's up to you. But if everyone were just to give 25 bucks, it's, it's a, it's a great concept we have. And we think we're going to match our goal and, and uh, get those 450 people. And hopefully that that's for $40,000, which will by far beat any other sports. Awesome. Awesome. That's huge. That match is huge, right? The matches are used. Like right now, people are don't you know all these other sports are getting their their their, their donate money. You see their totals. And there's a website you can go to. Um, Zeb Zeb's gonna. I think you emailed it out or you. I'll put in the show it. notes. We'll make sure we'll put in the sh- we put in the show notes too. That'd be great. Yeah, if you could do that. And, and you know, people are putting you know getting all this money up, but it doesn't double. It doesn't do anything. So at the last day of the year, when everyone's all sucked dry and already giving all their money as wrestling people we're then going to give because you know we we've told all our people don't give we're going to do it at the end of the end of the month so hopefully everyone can we get everyone to buy in and we'll be able to raise some money for the program awesome jim thanks for uh, letting us in on that because that's huge for obviously funding everything travel yeah it goes to our overall operating which i made a deal with our athletic director when i got when our new ad came came in and said so you know what do i what i got to do to, to get your program back to what you see. I said, give us our scholarships back and give us our coaches back. He's like, well, we got a fundraise for that. And I go, listen, you, you give me the scholarships, give me the coach. I'll fundraise my entire budget every year. And he looked at me and he goes, you got yourself a deal. And so that's what we're doing. And I'm about two years ahead of the schedule. So I have, I'm fundraising for three years from now. So this money that we're fundraising this year will be for three years from now. Oh, so you're sticking so, around for three more years. Got it. That's all well, I want to know. Listen, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm <laughs> whoever the next person, if, it, you know, if it's Danny Mitchiff, you know, then I'm, I'm, I'm kind of teaching him the way to do it for at the end of the day in wrestling. If you want to be successful in, 
wrestling at Kent State, you got to fundraise. You got to be good at it. You got to not even be good at it. You have to have get people engaged and want to be able to give back. One of the conversations we have with every kid that leaves is, hey, we're going to be calling you next fall for, you know, for our crowdfunding. And we're going to hope that you can start giving back the scholarship that you received during your time here. You know, it's, it's easy. And we try to get them to start doing it when they're young, because there's going to be a point when they have kids and they're married and house payments that they aren't going to be able to do it. And I, I totally respect that and understand that. But if you can get them while they're young, you don't bother them while they're trying to get their kids raised and, and through the diapers and through the formula and, and the daycare and, you know, hopefully pick them up in between that, like uh, junior high or fifth grade to, to college. And then you back off when the kids are in college and then you hit them up, you know, after the kids roll. And that's kind of the, the, the philosophy that I have with harassing people and trying to get them to give. Awesome. Nice. Yeah, anything else? <laughs> no, it's you. you got anything else? Uh, do I got? I mean, I got time, but we're going night. We know Zev could go all night. But. Yeah, we go all night. But <laughs> this was fun. This was fun. I've seen a lot of these. You know, I, I think it's fun just because we all want. To, you know, we all know each other. It's, it's, right. You know, no, we could, we could d- dug into a lot more stories, but this this could've. was fun. I was. Uh, I've been bugging Zev to get a hold of you to get you on here for the last few. But yeah, we month, talked about last lot. month or something. Yeah, it's been. Yeah, I've been pretty busy. I know he's busy. So Zeb's been sick. He hasn't been able to do much for the last like nine. I'm months good now though. I'm I'm back. I went to school uh, today. I'm I uh I feel better. Back to fighting. Uh, like I told you, I was dragging the the brush today, and I was burning the fire, and it made I was so cold, man. I was so bitterly cold. My my toes didn't freeze though. Hey, that's good. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Jim, thanks for the time. Jim Thank Anderson, the, the Barbarian Hour. Appreciate you being on here. Jared, give us a quick singlet special, would you? Thanks, Coach. Yeah, jump on uh, Barbarian Hour slash uh, BA Hour. Yep, Barbarian Apparel slash BA Hour. Gosh, right now it's a busy time of year for Josh and the crew down in Cincinnati, but uh, they got a bunch of team stores going on right now, but they're, they always got time, man. They, they, they excel on service, that's for certain. So. Awesome. Thanks, Coach. Appreciate the time tonight. Good catching up. It was a good season. Thank you, guys. All that. You know, I, I saw you more this summer than I had uh, in the last fifteen years. I feel. Yeah, I haven't seen you in a long time. I saw you. Good. Saw you. La- la- saw you last spring at the Sandusky yeah. Duels. I saw yeah. you at the concerts. Yeah. Yeah. So it goes like that sometimes. You don't see people. All of a you'll see them. Uh, see them a lot. So I haven't seen Marines your brother. Big Jim. Yeah, I haven't seen Jared or Drew in. I can't even tell you the last time. Yeah, I, I, he's four four houses down right here. I heard. I heard you. I have to see more than I want to, but that's, uh, that's all right. The way it goes, the good and bad. Lucky Listen, tough. I'm gonna I'm gonna get my hip better, and as soon as it gets better, we're gonna get some FaceTime. And, and I, I, you guys do an aerodyne workout? Oh, that's a Drew's jam, man. Drew's falling apart Ooh. like you, man. <laughs> I got an aerodyne, big Jim. No, well, Drew and I, I have on it. one. Drew and I actually Corey got Drew one for. Christmas. I got one too. So do I. Uh, I yeah, they're one. they're uh, they're amazing. Um, I yeah. got the old school one. I, got I upgraded it a little bit easier to use. Yeah, oh, I got a easy. pristine one, man. If you saw mine, you'd be like, that is nice. Drew had actually, <laughs> I need I to start getting on it. <laughs> Drew's broke, and I had a backup one that Drew had to, like, steal pieces for it earlier this week. Like, Drew's serious, like, serious about it. He's like, I'm, I need to get it fixed. Like, I can get it fixed, Drew. Take, take care of it. Yeah, Drew, Drew's an air dying guy. Money. But, Come on. but yeah, yeah, man. It was good chat, awesome. man. Good chat with you guys. It was good, fun. I, I really good enjoyed stuff. it. Good seeing you. Good seeing you. Guys, you. Have good a good, good holidays. Happy holidays. Tell your families I said hello. <laughs>